I am a reading streamer and I am on the first book from the Escape from Furnace series called Lockdown by Alexander Gordon Smith. We've made it through a few chapters last night and we're going to try and make it through as many chapters as we can tonight. I'm going to kind of do a synopsis of what happened in the book last night um, to give you an idea of what we're getting ready to get into tonight. So last night we learned about a young guy by the name of Alex. He's 14 years old and um, we've already had one death in this book. Um, Alex's friend Toby was murdered in cold blood by some guy in, guy in a black suit and we discovered that those are the caretakers of this penitentiary that um, takes in these kids a mile down below ground and weird stuff happens to them we're not sure what's going on but basically they're taken usually at night from what um, Alex's new bunk mate says and uh, it's just a creepy place so when a siren uh, sounds down there you have to either be inside of the yellow circle or in your um, your cells, jail cells. So basically there's a lot of weird stuff going on to some young kids and we just don't really know for sure what's going to happen to them. So without further ado, we will get into the book here. If you would not mind, uh, the author did ask me to mention the fact that these books are available on audiobook through Macmillan Publishing. And if you want to go jump over there, purchase the books, you can definitely do that. It won't be me reading them because I am reading them live with my own voice. I'm not um, reading these or uploading any of the audio from uh, Macmillan Publishing. Um, this is my take on these books. So here we go. The next chapter that we're reading is called Skirmish. Despite the food, I began to feel a bit more relaxed during trough time. With a little imagination, I could almost pretend that I was back at school, chatting with friends over hot lunches, which admittedly hadn't been much per uh, prettier than this anyway, and just enjoying time away from lessons. Instead of talking about teachers, soccer, and girls, though, we discussed life inside Furnace. But even that seemed distant like we were chatting about a film we'd seen on television or some new computer game. So there really is no way out, Z asked when Donovan had finished eating. The older boy had scoffed two helpings of muck and was eyeing the canteen hopefully on the chance there was any left. I mean, no tunnels, no secret exits. First off, you better watch what you say and who you say it to, he answered, giving up on thirds and returning his attention to the table. To the warden, talking about escaping is the same as, as escaping, and I can't even bring myself to tell you what happened to the last guy who actually made a break for it. Second, yeah, this place is full of tunnels, but they all only go in one direction. Down. This prison is wedged in a massive gorge, and as far as I know, there are tunnels in the rock that go much deeper than this. They use some of them for storage, and some for the warden's offices. And I know from personal experience that the hole is down there. The hole, Z and I both asked together. Solitary. I was down there for three days after I got into a fight with some gang wranglers. Not the skulls, the leopards. They're not really around anymore. Anyway, it was just a hole in the ground right at the bottom of the prison, and they lock you in it with no light or food and only a pipe for a toilet. The only water you get is the condensation on the walls. His face had paled from the memory. After a day, you think you're going crazy. After two days, you think you're in hell. After three days, you lose a little piece of yourself that you don't get back. I never heard of anyone being in there more than four days and surviving. That place drives your soul right out of your body. It's the screams you hear when you're down there, like demons. They don't ever shut up. He shook his head, seeming to come out of a trance. I'll die before I go back in there. I didn't know what to say, so I kept my mouth closed. But Z didn't seem as phased by the threat of solitary confinement. But some of these tunnels must go somewhere. I mean, 
underground passageways, that sort of thing. Well, you're welcome to try, replied Donovan with more than a hint of sarcasm. I don't think you'd be the first, and I doubt you'll be the last, but believe me when I say that the hole isn't the worst thing you'll find behind these walls. Hey, maybe you'll get lucky. Maybe they'll take you tonight, and you'll see for yourself. Take me? asked Z. Take me where? But Donovan wasn't listening. Z turned to me, but I just shrugged. He slumped back on the bench, obviously annoyed. So, your old cellmate, Adam, was he your friend? I asked, changing the subject. Friend, Donovan replied, as if trying to remember the word. You don't have friends in here. You'll soon come to understand that. You get attached to someone, then you'll just lose them. They'll get shanked, or they'll jump, and they'll be take, or they'll be taken one night. When you reach 18, they get sent up to level 15, and you'll lose them then, too. Not that many survive to 18. He paused when a shout echoed across the room, starting again when it died away. Don't make friends. Don't make connections. They'll see it, and it will get you both killed. Don't make the mistake of bringing your heart down here with you. There is no place for it in Furnace. The shout rang out again, angrier this time. Donovan seemed to freeze. His hackles raised, and I felt my heartbeat quicken. There was a growing tension in the room. You could almost see it, like a black shadow seeping over the tables and compressing the air. It was emanating from a bench on the opposite side of the trough room where two inmates were on their feet, nose to nose. Let's go, Donovan hissed, getting up. Other people were doing the same, eyeing the confrontation warily as they made for the exit. What's going on? Z asked. Trouble, was his reply, and we don't want to be anywhere near it. As if on cue, there was another sound and a metallic crash. I looked back to see one of the boys reeling backward, a red gash in his head where something had struck him. His attacker was preparing for another blow, the tray raised above his head, the sharp edge directed forward like an axe. Can't we do something? I asked, but we'd reached the tunnel and Donovan was already walking inside. Feel free, he shouted over his shoulder. I stood and watched for a moment longer, but... As the makeshift blade descended, I was pushed forward by the crowd, and the moment was lost behind the blood-red wall. For the next few minutes, chaos reigned in Furnace. We emerged into the yard just as one long blast rang out from the siren. The sound seemed to activate the machine guns lined up along the walls. They spun out toward the crowd of panicking inmates, their slick, smooth movements reminding me of some crazy homicidal robot on the rampage. The deafening wail of the siren had the effect of a fuel injection on everybody in the giant room. It was like somebody had hit the fast-forward button, making the inmates move at a ridiculous speed. Most were running for the stairs, their fear palpable as they pushed each other out of the way. Even Donovan was jogging across the yard, his usual calm expression twisted into a mask of apprehension. He shouted something, but it was lost in the noise of the stampede and the unending scream of the siren. The terror was contagious, flooding my mind and making my head swim. I felt something crash into me from behind and I sprawled out over the hard ground, a sharp pain running up my arm from a twisted wrist. Ahead of me lay an engine of legs, each a piston that trampled anything in its path. I struggled to get up, but something struck my arm from out, out from under me. I wrapped my hands around my head and curled into a ball as the kicks rained in from every side, just wishing for it to be over to wake up from this sick nightmare. After what seemed like an eternity, I felt somebody grab my wrist, hard, and haul me up. I resisted for a second, but the force was insistent, and I relented. Opening my eyes, I saw Donovan above me, his expression furious. Digging his fingers into my flesh, he pulled me along with the tide, shoving other kids out of the way until we reached the stairs. I followed without thinking, my brain too exhausted to do anything other than put one foot in front of the other, and it wasn't very successful at that either. Like the aftermath of a tsunami, the flood had died to a trickle by the time we reached the sixth level, buoying us into our cell only seconds before the siren cut out. The absence of sound was almost as disturbing as the noise itself. The prison had been plunged into a gulf of silence, broken only by the occasional sob, but it didn't last. With a noise a little like the one a roller coaster makes as it's being pulled up a slope, the cell doors began to slide shut. 
a thousand gates sealing with a boom that made the very stone tremble. Donovan had slumped onto my bed and was wiping beads of uh, sweat off his brow. I didn't even have the energy to make it to the bunks and just slid down the cold metal bars until my knees hit the floor. For a moment, neither of us did anything but pant. My whole body was aching. My stomach felt like it was unpeeling itself, like I was coming apart. I offered silent prayers of thanks that I hadn't eaten dinner. Below, on the ground floor, I could see the vault door opening and a dark shadow sweep across the yard toward the trough room. There must have been twelve or thirteen black suits down there, armed with guns. Dogs? asked Donovan in a whisper. Then, when I didn't answer, the dogs, are they out there? I watched the vault door swing shut, but nothing else had come out. I shook my head, not quite able to speak. Donovan muttered a thank you to someone or something, and I heard him collapse back onto the bed. Is anyone out of their cell? he went on. I scanned the circumference of the prison and saw dozens of faces peering out through the bars at the events of unfolding below, but everybody seemed to be locked up pretty tight. I shook my head again, then twisted around on my knees and found a more comfortable position leaning against the wall. Jesus, Donovan said eventually, directing his words at the bunk above him. Talk about an induction. You've been here a couple of hours and you've seen a skirmish and a lockdown. You should consider yourself lucky. Lockdown, I asked, not feeling in the least bit lucky. That siren, that long one, it translates as get the hell back in your cell in the next minute or your ass is grass, he explained, finally turning to look at me. Lockdown is one of the worst things that can happen here. This wasn't one isn't too bad, it's just the guards. That skirmish in the trough room must have triggered it. Sometimes fights do, sometimes they don't. The worst lockdowns come for no reason. One minute you're playing cards in the yard, and the next you're all running for your lives, trampling each other so you don't get torn to pieces when... He paused, his voice catching in his throat. I didn't want to press him. Something about his expression made me hold my tongue. Besides, I wasn't sure I wanted to know anymore. I clambered off of, up off the floor and walked to the bunk, sitting down at the foot of the bed and putting my head in my hands. He swung himself around so we were sitting side by side. Look, I said sheepishly, I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks for coming back for me. I would have been pummeled out there. He looked at me and nodded, but his eyes were cold. Don't mention it, but don't expect it again. I told you, there are no friendships here, no loyalties. I helped you because you're new, and because when there's two people in a cell, then there's only a 50% chance that they'll take you. You'd better wise up, Alex. I'm not your guardian angel. I knew already that Carl Donovan was many things, but he was a terrible liar. I found myself smiling inside, although a sliver of that smile must have escaped through my eyes because Donovan caught it. I don't know what you're so happy about, he muttered, but that tiny smile was contagious and took strength from the adrenaline that still pounded through our arteries. He flashed a wide grin at me, all white teeth against his dark skin, and gave me a gentle cuff around the back of the head. You're crazy, you know that? You belong in here, no doubt about that. I just nodded. We sat in silence for a few minutes, our heartbeats gradually slowing, and the rasp disappearing from our breaths. It wasn't long before I saw movement below and walked over to the bars to see the crowd of black suits head back across the yard, carrying the wounded kid between them. He wasn't moving, and there was a thin red line on the stone floor that trailed behind the group as they disappeared through the massive door. Are they taking him to the infirmary? I asked, quite pleased with myself despite everything for remembering the posh word for a prison hospital. Something like that. Donovan clambered up into his own bunk and lay facing the ceiling. Anyway, lockdowns this late don't tend to finish until morning, so I'd make myself comfortable if I were you. Be lights out in an hour or two. I looked around the cell and tried to imagine what I'd do for an hour or two. The thought felt like a weight pressing on my chest, and once again, I found myself panicking at the idea of spending the rest of my life in this tiny cell. The sensation ran up through my body, and when it reached my brain, it was so powerful that for a moment, I saw lights popping on and off before my eyes. I wanted to tear through the bars and fight my way back to the surface so I could be free again. Instead, I just stamped my foot against the floor, 
so pathetically that not even Donovan heard it. The feeling ebbed from my body, unsatisfied, and I collapsed on my bunk. So, is that what you do all evening, then? I asked eventually. Sit and stare at the ceiling and rot away quietly? Pretty much, he replied, laughing. The bed squeaked as he turned over. To be honest, with jobs and all, you're usually dead to the world by lights out, so you don't mind the peace and quiet. Jobs? You'll find out all about it tomorrow, he replied. I could hear his voice starting to slur, like he was drifting off already. You think we just sit about all day? Sitting around, dueling with canteen trays and running from guards? Yeah. Oh, and listen, he said, his voice alive again. He popped his head over the bunk and fixed me with a glare that made my pulse race. If you hear a siren during lights out and the blood lights are on, then you don't get out of bed for any reason, okay? Doesn't matter what you hear outside those bars. Keep your eyes closed and pretend to be asleep. Don't draw attention to yourself and especially not to this cell. I tried to say something, but he cut me off. No exceptions. They catch you looking, then you're as good as dead already. He vanished, leaving me wide awake and terrified. Sweet dreams, Alex. Darkness falls. I don't believe that anyone truly loses their fear of the dark. Yeah, grown-ups act like they feel at home when the lights are out. They say there's nothing to be afraid of, that nothing's changed just because you can't see anything. But they're bluffing. I defy even the bravest adult to spend the night in a place like Furnace in the pitch black without thinking that every noise is something right behind you with dagger teeth and eyes of silver and blood on its breath. That every whisper of air that runs over your skin is the rush of a descending blade. That every flicker of movement is a tendril of darkness wrapping itself around your throat and coiling in the pit of your belly where it feasts on your soul. The darkness came without warning. One minute I was lying on my bed thinking pretty rationally about my life behind bars. The next, I was plunged into a void so profound that I thought I'd gone blind. It was such a sudden change that I sat bolt upright, clawing at my eyes, and desperately looking for even the slightest hint of light to prove that I still had the ability to see. I stumbled out of my bunk, crawling across the rough floor with my stomach in my mouth. I was in such a panic that I crashed right into the bars, but through them, far below, I caught a glimpse of the giant screen mounted above the elevator, a white furnace logo rotating lazily on a black background. The darkness was doing its best to smother the image, but its weak illumination reached out like a beacon. I clung to the bars and watched it, the sensation of relief so powerful that it brought tears to my eyes. It was here, holding the bars of my cell like they were my only friends, that I first heard the symphony of Furnace. It started with the sobs, which rose up out of the darkness all around me like a, the gentle strings in an orchestra. They began as hushed moans choked back by the countless musicians that crafted them merging together from every level to create a fountain of sound that ran down to the deserted yard below. Next came the jeers, the tuneful taunts of new fish, and you better cry, they're coming for you, which punctuated the sobbing like sharp blasts from trumpet trumpets. As the callous taunts grew in volume, so did the cries, swelling into desperate wails hurled out into the artificial night mixed with calls for help and pleas that were heartbreaking to hear. Somewhere, somebody was singing a song, his deep voice a bizarre bass line to the symphony, a mournful cello that kept the two halves of the orchestra in harmony. I don't know how long it went on, rising gradually to a crescendo of screams and whistles and sobs and songs that took hold of me, forcing a cry from my own traitorous throat. From what I knew would be the first time of many, I reluctantly added my voice to that symphony, crying and screaming until, exhausted, the music died and the prison once again found silence. How horrible. I know I don't have to tell you that I didn't get much sleep that night. I lay in my bed with my eyes open, projecting pictures onto the blank black canvas before me. Images of my home, of my family, of my friends, of television, of school, of birthday cakes and bike rides and trips to the country, of the sea, skimming stones, ice cream on the sand, soccer matches and kick-arounds in the playground, building models with my dad, 
weeding the garden with my mom, of sunshine, of rain, of snowmen and Christmas and playing with new toys in the flickering light of the fire. But each happy image was smothered by the darkness, vanishing without a trace into the dead night. Furnace was claiming my memories as well as my body, its hold on my life now absolute, unforgiving. All the time I lay there, I expected to hear the siren. I wasn't sure what Donovan had been talking about when he said they came at night, but my imagination provided plenty of scenarios. The black suits appearing at the bars ready to drag me into the abyss. The gas masks and their pockmarked eyes pointing at me like I was the next delicacy they were going to drop down their sick throats. The skinless dogs, wet to the touch as they pulled me to the warden and his leather face. Whenever I did manage to drop off to sleep, these terrifying images followed me, making themselves at home in dreams they had no right to be in. In some, I was being buried in a grave cut into the rock, the black suits covering me with rubble that pressed my body flat and choked my lungs. In others, I actually sank into the floor, the stone like red quicksand that sucked me in until I was lost in shadow. In the worst dreams, though, I was inside a glass prison on the surface. Through the walls, I could see my house, my family going about their life without me. I shouted to them and banged on the glass, but there was a gas mask right in front of me, preventing them from hearing. And I saw the black suits approaching my front door, the gas mask freaks closing in on the back of the house, the dogs leaping through the windows, spraying my mom and dad with glass. I tried to smash the walls of my prison, but they wouldn't even crack. The weezer in front of me blocking my every move, and I could do nothing but watch as they met the same fate as Toby, their blood pooling over the kitchen floor as their killers retreated. It was only at the end of the dream that I realized the figure before me, on the other side of the glass, wasn't a gas mask at all. It was my reflection. After each dream, I'd wake up screaming, sweat pouring from me and my heart in overdrive. Each time it took me ages to drift off again, and each time the same thing happened. Nightmares that tried to eat me alive. By the time the lights came on, serenaded in by a short blast from the siren, I felt like I'd been lying on that bed for a thousand years, tormented by every demon possible. My sheet was drenched and my head was pounding, and when I slung my, swung my legs over the bunk, Every limb was shaking like a leaf. It took only one glance through the bars at the prison beyond to send me stumble running across the cell to the toilet, throwing up my guts into the dull metal pan. Nothing came out apart from a thin trail of bile, but it made me feel better, like I'd purged myself of some of the thoughts from the previous night. The sound of my retching had woken Donovan, and by the time I'd pulled my head from the toilet, he was sitting up in bed, watching me with a sympathetic smile. Takes a while for the nightmares to leave, he said. But they do. Trust me. That toilet and me were best friends for the first few days I was here. I laughed, despite myself. Wiping my mouth with my sleeve, I realized that puking wasn't the only thing I needed the toilet for. I glanced at Donovan sheepishly. Um, do you mind? He raised an eyebrow, then cottoned on to what I meant, his head disappearing as he lay back down. Sorry, Alex, he said as I went about my business. That's the other thing you never really get used to. Pooping in public. Well, it would be a lot easier to relax if you'd keep quiet for a second, I scolded. The bed creaked as he laughed, but fortunately he didn't say another word until he heard the flush. My turn, he said, jumping from the bunk. All yours. Doing my best to ignore the noises behind me, I stared through the bars at the cells directly opposite. Inmates were climbing from their bunks, all pasty faces and crumpled uniforms. Judging by some of their expressions, I wasn't the only one who'd had nightmares. My eyes fell on one cell, on the next level below. It was pretty far away and sat in a strange angle, but I thought I could make out Montgomery curled up on the stone next to the bars. I saw a pair of legs on the upper bunk, which no doubt belonged to Chief Skull Kevin. From the looks of things, the bottom bunk was stripped bare. I wondered if poor Montgomery had spent the whole night on the floor. So, you ready for some hard labor? asked Donovan, flushing the toilet. He had an apologetic look on his face and was wafting the air with both hands. That mush plays havoc downstairs, you know. You're not kidding, I replied, holding my nose and wishing, not for the last time during my stay in Furnace, that we had separate bathrooms. Anyway, what do you mean hard labor? 
He grinned as he pulled on his shoes, then offered the same infuriating reply I'd already heard so many times. You'll find out soon enough. <laughs> Hard labor. Ten minutes or so after the lights had come back on, the siren cut through my head a second time and the cell doors rattled open. With a series of whoops and cheers, the inmates on every level crashed along the platforms and down the stairs, filling the prison with the sound of thunder. When you're locked up in here for life, you learn to welcome the little freedoms, explained Donovan as we made our way from our cell. His face was once again a mask of defiance, challenging anyone to mess with him. But his tone was light enough. Getting out of our cells every morning feels a little bit like we're breaking free, if you know what I mean. I didn't, not then, but I soon came to understand. Part of you soon forgets about the outside world. There is just lockdown and out there. And out there, in the yard, in the trough room at hard labor, feels a hell of a lot freer than a two-meter square cell. As we made our way down to the yard, Donovan explained about the jobs. Mornings were spent working, slop work was in the kitchen, grease up meant cleaning duties, which sometimes included the stink, or mopping the toilets, bleaching was in the laundry. According to the duty roster displayed in crisp white letters on the giant screen above the elevator, Donovan and I were chippers for the day. It's the hardest of hard labors, he said as we followed the crowd through to the trough room. We picked up a couple of bowls of mush from the canteen and found an empty bench, close enough to the scene of yesterday's incident that I could make out a weird, rust-colored stain on the floor. I focused on my breakfast to try to take my mind off the fight. It was a pile of sawdust-colored paste that looked identical to yesterday's dinner. The same thing? I asked, feeling my stomach grumble. I wasn't sure if it was because I was hungry or because my gut was warning me not to go near the dish. Yeah, Donovan replied, lifting a heap of paste up with his spoon and dyeing it suspiciously. Exactly the same. They make it in batches. Each lasts a few days. You have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Great, I muttered. I knew I was going to have to eat something sooner or later, so I scraped a thin layer off the top of my breakfast and touched my tongue to it. I was expecting the flavor of vomit or crap or something equally nasty, but to my surprise, I couldn't taste anything. Taking a deep breath, I closed my mouth around the spoon and felt the runny mixture drop onto my tongue. For a second, I gagged, but then I managed to control the reflex and noticed that the goo was completely flavorless except for the pleasant tang of salt. The texture is the worst part, Donovan explained, scooping the last dollop from his bowl. Just think of it as salty porridge and it isn't too bad. I remember how my dad always put about a kilo of salt in his porridge, as opposed to honey or sugar or jam like sane people, and the thought made me feel better. My appetite took over and I wolfed down the paste with a passion, almost sucking the plastic from the spoon in my eagerness. The gunk was lukewarm, but it settled in my stomach and radiated a pleasant, comforting heat. The morning's third short siren blast saw everybody making their way out of the trough room, back into the yard, where the crowd gradually split into a number of groups. I followed Donovan to the other side of the huge space toward a cavernous fissure in the rock, guarded by a black suit and his shotgun. I felt my legs go weak at the sight of him, but the sheer density of the people around me held me up as we stomped past. <clears throat> Excuse me. The short tunnel ahead led us to a room filled to bursting with mining equipment. Picks, shovels, wheelbarrows, and dozens of hard hats that clung to the walls like yellow fungus. Around the outside of the room were three more cracks, gaping black mouths in the rocks. Two were open, but a third, in the center, was sealed off with enormous wooden planks bolted into the rock. Donovan slammed a hard hat onto his head, switching on the lamp fixed to the front and held another one out for me. I took it as the black suit walked to the center of the cluttered space and began to speak. You know the drill. Dig and clear. His voice was like the rumbling of some subterranean river, muted by the rock. Shaft props every three meters. Hats on at all times. We want you to fit, we want you fit to work again tomorrow. Anyone caught smuggling equipment out gets two days in the hole. Any skirmishing gets you three. By now, most of the hundred or so inmates in the room were kitted up. Some held picks or shovels, and others were hoisting the ancient metal wheelbarrows off the ground. 
Not knowing what to do, I grabbed a pick from the wall. It was so heavy I nearly dropped it, the spike coming worryingly close to the foot of the guy standing next to me. I ra I, sorry, I tensed my muscles and managed to stop his descent, but Donovan was already flashing me a concerned look. Levels one through three, you're through the first door, the black suit went on. Levels four through six, get in the third door. Room two is out of bounds. Move it. Our huddle of prisoners shuffled forward with about as much enthusiasm as if there had been an electric chair waiting beyond that hole in the wall. I could almost imagine them as old-time miners singing, Hi-ho, hi-ho, as they marched into darkness. Only these workers were calling out insults to one another and making threatening gestures with their picks. I kept my head down and trailed Donovan. Don't worry, kid, he said as we stomped through the tunnel. Only another 20,000 or so days of this to go. My pick suddenly got a lot heavier, as did my heart. We emerged into a wide cavern, the ceiling so low that I had to stoop in places to avoid the drooping rock. Everywhere I looked, there were long, thin beams propping up the ceiling, a forest of twigs that didn't look anywhere near as strong enough to hold up the million or so tons of stone above our heads. I pictured what would happen if gravity took over, bringing down the roof of the cave and squashing us like a boot crushing a bug. At least it would be quick. Swallowing hard, I managed to force the claustrophobic panic from my mind. Better pray there isn't a cave-in today, said Donovan, his words practically turning my stomach inside out. The rock walls of the cave had been battered and broken into weird shapes. Most looked like curtains in a theater, full of shadowy folds that stood out against the rich red surface. They might be good hiding places, and I stored the information away in the back of my mind in case they ever needed it. Then, I remembered the flayed dogs and instantly dismissed the thought. Donovan led the way to a distant section of the cave and rested his pig against the rock. Don't need a degree in rocket science to do this job, he said. Just keep whacking until downtime. When you can't see your feet for rubble, give a shout to one of the wheelies and they'll come clear up, okay? And to think my mom and dad never thought I'd hold down a job, I answered. We both fought to hide our grins, then... Motioning for me to stand out of the way, Donovan swung his pick to one side and brought it forward with a cry of rage. The metal blade struck the rock with a flash of light and a, and a pistol crack, showering us both with shrapnel. Ow! I yelled, hurriedly pulling down the hard hat's visor to avoid being blinded. Some fun, huh? Donovan shouted as he swung again. Making sure there was nobody around me that I could inadvertently injure, I hoisted the pick above my head ready to swing. I'd completely forgotten about the low ceiling, however, and the move generated a shower of rock that drummed off my hat. Donovan frowned through his visor, and I felt my cheeks reddened. I tensed my arms again, and this time swung the picks in a sideways arc. It struck the rock with a deafening clang, and a vibration that traveled up my arms and practically dislodged the vertebrae in my spine. Wincing, I waited until the pain had subsided before trying again. This time, I gave the rock a delicate tap that barely shaved off a whisker of dust. Takes a bit of time to get used to the impact, said Donovan between strikes. But that's okay. In here, time is the only thing you've got plenty of. I tried twice more, ignoring the sensation that my spine was being ripped out with each strike. After a few minutes, tiredness set in, but with it came a pleasant numbness that spread through my body. The lamp on my helmet threw the rock face into a mosaic of light and shadow. I started looking for features in the stone that resembled faces, ridges for foreheads, scratches that might have been noses, pick marks as lips, a loose pebble like sightless eyes, and pretend they were the black suits. Each time I swung right for the center of the face, releasing a scream of anger and hatred that lent power to the attack, and when the faces crumpled into fragments, I felt a little shiver of pleasure. <coughs> Excuse me. The strength of my feelings was a little unnerving. The knowledge that, at that moment, I could have driven a pick right through the real guard who would, who would appear in the cave every now and again to check that everybody was working. Hatred, real murderous hatred, was an emotion I'd never really experienced before, and I wasn't sure whether it excited me or terrified me. It's incredible how much stamina you can find when you're fighting an enemy in battle, even if that enemy is just in your imagination. But 
what, for what must have been three or four hours, everyone in that cave swung their picks at the rock relentlessly, like barbarians bringing down the walls of a castle. The sound of picks striking rock, the flash of the sparks, and the screams that powered each swing made my ears ring and my blood pound. It really was like an ancient battle, and I started to wonder just how long the black suits would last if all of Furnace's inmates picked up their tools and turned on their captors. Donovan and I must have cleared away a good meter of rock by ourselves. It doesn't sound like much, but we're not talking about chalk here. These walls were tough. The rubble built up around our feet and was cleared away by the guys with wheelbarrows to be deposited in some unknown place. Probably mixed with our food, I thought, eyeing the piles of dust slumped like fallen soldiers on the ground between us. I was still pummeling the wall with a passion when the black suit appeared again and called for us to put down the tools. It was only as we all wove our way back through the ceiling props, dragging our picks behind us, that the pain slowly started to ebb back into my body. It began as a dull throb, but by the time we'd hung up our equipment, it felt as though every muscle I had was on fire. Hey, Nebu! <laughs> I joined your stream for just like a, a short period of time and then realized what time it was. Um, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> We were told to wait until the other group marched back into the equipment room. Then the black suit herded us out of the tunnel, back into the yard. I wondered why nobody had bothered to search us. The picks may have been impossible to smuggle out, but some of the rock fragments had, we had chipped away were sharper than scalpels. It soon became clear when we were led through another rough-cut door to a long room full of shadow showers. Five minutes, shouted the black suit. I watched as everybody began to strip keeping their uniforms and underwear into a pile in the corner, then drifting out to stand beneath the overhanging shower heads. I did the same, feeling extremely self-conscious as I pulled off my clothes, but we were all in the same big naked boat and nobody seemed the least bit bothered by it. I picked a spot at the far side of the room and, to my surprise, found that Donovan had followed me. Brace yourself, he said. Seconds later, there was an alarming squeal followed by a hiss. Then the shower heads all erupted. I flinched as a jet of freezing water hit me square in the back, forcing the air from my lungs, but thankfully the temperature soon adjusted. Still cold, just not arctic. I frantically scrubbed myself down, noticing the water turn red from the dust that clung to me, pooling around the drains as if we were all being bled dry. I shook the image from my head as Donovan started talking. Bet your arms feel like they're made of putty, he said, his voice raised above the spray. Yeah, what were we doing in there anyway? I never heard of guards encouraging their prisoners to tunnel through the walls before. Well, most prison walls aren't several miles thick, he replied, wiping water from his eyes and spitting red. We're carving out new rooms. We chipped out this very room here, stone by stone. Took three years. Before then, we washed in our cells, buckets and sponges like some shanty town. I tried whistling to demonstrate how impressed I was at the sheer size of the room, but all that came out of my wet lips was a bubbly farting sound. To be honest, though, he went on, I think they just make us hammer away for a few hours every day or so we're exhausted. It gets something out of our systems. Knackered inmates are a lot easier to control than pumped up ones. He paused for a thought. And sometimes there are cave-ins, like in room two the other week. And dead inmates are even easier to control, if you follow me. I wasn't sure if he was joking or not, but given what I already knew about Furnace, I was guessing that he was deadly serious. I gave my hair a quick rinse just as the shower set off, shut off, and we all marched back across the room. While we'd been washing, someone had taken away our dirty clothes, and there was a pile of new uniforms, underwear, and paper shoes by the door. Donovan slapped his way past several pink, shivering bodies and scrambled into his duds, but I was happy to wait. It's not like there was a variety of sizes and colors. The jumpsuit I eventually put on hung off me with the same disregard for my body shape as the last one. We traipsed back out into the yard, which was a flurry of activity, as the various groups of workers returned from their jobs. It was weird, but as we crossed over to the trough room, I actually started to feel like I was getting into the swing of furnace. This place was dangerous, yes, but there was a routine here that was almost comforting. Sleep, work, and relax sleep, work, and relax. The system was like a heartbeat that kept us all functioning, 
a rhythm that made me feel like maybe things wouldn't be so bad here. Of course, it was right at that very moment that all hell broke loose. Skull fodder. <laughs> that sounds like a great title. <laughs> Donovan and I entered the trough room to the sound of jeering. At first, I couldn't pinpoint precisely where it was coming from above the general chatter. The hall was half full of inmates who had obviously beaten us to the showers, their cheeks glowing above starched collars. As we strolled across the floor, however, it became clear that the noise was emanating from behind the canteen. Four skulls were standing on the other side of the counter, each wearing the trademark black bandana. Two of the kids were dishing out bowls of slop to the huddle of waiting inmates, but the others were looking at something at their feet, something hidden behind the stainless steel canteen counters. From the way they moved, it looked like they were kicking out at whatever it was, and the evil glint in their eyes stripped my appetite away in seconds. I couldn't face getting any closer to the skulls, so I let Donovan go ahead while I scanned the hall for a familiar face. Z was sitting on his own in the middle of the room, poking his slop forlornly with a spoon. I walked over to the other side of his bench, doing my best to ignore the pain in my legs as I sat down. He barely even raised his head to acknowledge me, and his expression told me something terrible has happened. Something terrible has happened, he said when I uttered my thoughts out loud. You know, I thought I could take it here, put up with anything they threw at me until I found a way out, but I just don't know anymore. Did someone attack you? I asked, alarmed. The black suits? The skulls? He shook his head, then looked up at me as if about to reveal the most shameful secret of all time. They made me clean the toilets, Alex, he whispered. Every single bowl on the first level. That's nearly 100 crappers for your information, most of which still had evidence of... He looked like he was about to gag. I've had a shower, but I can still smell it on me. I did my best to hold it in, but I couldn't help myself. The laugh bubbled up from deep inside me like a fountain, and I howled so loudly that practically the entire hall turned and scowled in my direction. It was a good few seconds before I managed to plug it, but by that time, Z was struggling to maintain his mask of distaste. The lines around his eyes eventually relaxed, and his face opened up like a flower. I thought you'd been in a fight or something, I said, his grin letting me know it was safe to go on. You look like you're about to jump. Well, let's see how you feel when you're cleaning someone else's crap out of your fingernails, came his response. The jeering was still ongoing from the far side of the room, but I couldn't face turning around to see what was happening. Instead, I asked Z. Some poor kid, he answered. They've had him pinned to the floor for the last quarter of an hour. As far as I can tell, they're making him lip lick up anything they drop. It's horrible, but what can you do? He looked sheepishly at his lunch. I mean, better him than us, right? Luckily, I was saved from having to answer as Donovan crashed down onto the bench beside me and tucked into a massive bowl of slop. How was your first morning? he asked Z as he chewed. What job did you get? The stink, he hissed. Donovan pulled a face that was half grimace, half grin. Tough break for a new fish. Still, we all gotta do it. Well, next time you do it, can you try to miss the seat? This time we all laughed, but it was short-lived. I heard a crunch behind me and a peal of ugly laughter. Beneath it all was a quiet sob that seemed to claw its way into my chest and burrow right inside my heart. Did you see who it was? I asked Donovan. He was lifting a spoonful of food to his mouth and paused to consider the question. No one you know, kiddo, he said eventually, but his hesitation had already given away too much. It's Montgomery, isn't it? I said. Donovan let the spoon fall to his dish and nodded. Christ, I saw him on his cell this morning. Kevin made him sleep on the floor as far as I could see. They're going to kill him at this rate. Both Donovan and Z were staring at the table like there was an escape plan written on it. This place is full of unwritten rules, whispered Donovan without looking up. There always has to be someone to take the punches. That's how it works. It isn't fair. It isn't right. But that kid licking slop off the floor over there means that we get to eat in peace. If there was no scapegoat, then we'd all be in danger. If you follow... I follow you, I barked. My anger surprised me. It didn't make any sense. Back in school, Toby and I had always picked on the weaker kids. Guys just like Montgomery. They didn't fight back. They didn't argue. They gave you what you wanted, then went and cried in the corner. 
I wasn't sure why I felt such a burning anger inside of me at the thought of Montgomery getting picked on now. Such rage at the idea that nobody was going to help him. So we just leave him until he can't go on anymore, then hope the next scapegoat isn't one of us, right? Listen, spat Donovan, his fraying temper obvious from the way he glared at his bowl. You've been here one day and you think you can change things. I've been here five years and I know how the system works. You try to be a hero, then you'll get a shank in the back. You try to help that kid, then tomorrow it's going to be you both licking crap off the floor. Let me know if you're going to do something stupid, kid, because I'll ditch you like that. He snapped his fingers. The thin, wet cry from the canteen had coated Donovan's every word, leaving me with a gut-wrenching mixture of frustration and fury and fear. I couldn't work out which emotion was which. They all sat like unwanted guests in the pit of my stomach. I looked at Z, but he still wouldn't meet my eyes. I called his name, gently, and he raised his head like it was made of stone. I want to help him, but... He trailed off. If this was at school, you know... I'd do what I could, but we're a long way from the playground. The moan behind me changed pitch into a shriek, and this time I couldn't help myself. I glanced over my shoulder and saw one of the skulls grinding his foot down, while the others flicked slop from a ladle onto the unseen figure below. What about the guards? I asked. Surely they don't allow this. They don't care, said Donovan. Nobody cares. You shouldn't either. But I did. Every fiber of my body wanted to step in and help, and every fiber of my body wanted to stay on that bench and forget it was happening. I thought that any minute I'd literally be torn in two, reduced to a quivering bloody mess on the canteen floor. It was the smallest of things that made up my mind. One of the skulls looked up at his friend and flashed him a wicked smile. It was an expression I knew well. I'd worn it a thousand times at school after getting a good haul. Looking at it now was like staring into a mirror, seeing a side of myself full of greed and treachery and violence, and without a shred of compassion. I hated myself right then, and the overpowering feeling brought a red shadow down over my thoughts, blotting out any rational argument. Before I even knew what I was doing, I was out of my seat, ignoring the protests from Donovan and Z. My blind rage drove me across that room like a bulldozer. I pushed straight past the inmates still waiting to be served and jumped onto the counter. Everything was in slow motion and strangely distorted like I was watching it through water. I saw two faces right before me looking up in shock. The other skulls hadn't even noticed. They were too busy tormenting the, the round, sobbing figure beneath their feet. Then, as if the whole world had been holding its breath and finally decided to gulp down some air, time snapped back to normal. With a scream, I kicked out hard with my right foot. Years of playing soccer paid off as my paper shoe connected with the face of the first skull, and with a crack that might have been his nose or my toe breaking, his head jerked backward and he crumpled to the floor. I tried to direct a second kick, but the skull was quicker, grabbing my foot and pulling me off balance. I half jumped, half fell, and by some miracle of chance, tumbled off the canteen serving counter right on top of him. He hit the ground hard and I landed knee first in the center of his chest, crushing his lungs. Momentum carried me forward and I crashed into the wall behind the canteen, stars exploding in my vision. Panicking that somebody would stab me in the back, I whipped my body around, scrabbling for purchase on the smooth stone. The other two skulls were charging at me and I had to duck as the ladle flew past my ear, showering me with gunk. I had never been in a full-on fight like this and I had no idea what to do next. Fortunately, adrenaline was making me act without thinking and I threw myself at the kid who'd just swung the ladle. The move was half punch, half jump, and missed entirely. Denied contact, my flailing arm shot out. I lost my balance again, and I staggered straight into an oncoming fist. I'd always thought that getting punched would be painful, but it isn't. Not at the moment of impact, anyway. It's like your body switches off its senses during a fight to stop you getting overloaded. You hear a wet thump, and for a moment your world spins, but there is no pain. The absence of sensation caught me by surprise, and suddenly I felt like Superman, unbeatable, impervious to everything. I angled my head to the side to avoid the next punch that came in, then planted my palms in the middle of the skull's chest and shoved with all my might. He tripped on the still-prone body of Montgomery and almost did a backflip before tumbling earthward. I detected movement in the corner of my eye and ducked instinctively, the ladle skimming over my head. I swung an elbow in the direction of the attack and felt it connect. 
The skull, whose cheekbone I'd just fractured, yelped before slumping back against the canteen. I grabbed his collar with my left hand and with my right started to pound him. They weren't hammer blows by any stretch of the imagination, but they came hard and fast. And after three or four, he was bruised, bloody, and bleeding through his split lips. He looked at me with real fear in his eyes, and I tried to picture what my expression must look like. The word demonic sprang to mind. But then his bloody mouth twisted into a smile, and I suddenly realized things had taken a turn for the worse. I pe felt a pair of strong arms wrap themselves around my chest, pinning my arms. I thrashed from side to side, but it was no good. The skull had me locked tight, and I was powerless to defend myself as the kid in front started pun throwing punches of his own. He was much better at it than I was, and each strike made my world fade closer to black. There was still no pain, but there was something worse. A creeping numbness that was spreading through my body, and the unmistakable terrifying sensation that I was being seriously damaged. I put my final reserves of energy into a last bid for escape, and managed to push back with my legs. I, and the kid holding me, collapsed to the ground as one, but he still didn't let go. I looked up to see the guy who'd been thumping me and the skull I'd winded. Both were advancing like lions on a wounded gazelle, with nothing but murder in their eyes. All this had taken place in less than a minute, but the trough room was almost deserted. From the angle I was lying in, I could see past the canteen and watched as the last few people hurried from the hall. Only one figure remained, and for a second, hope flared as I pictured Donovan coming to help. But he simply shook his head at me, turned and walked toward the yard. Even Montgomery had struggled to his feet and was trotting off without so much as a backward glance. The bloodlust inside me suddenly subsided, leaving me utterly alone. The adrenaline had escaped my veins, and it felt like it had left lead weights in its place. Even without the guy beneath me and his bear hug, I still don't think I would have had the energy to move a muscle. My fearless expression had deserted me too, and I could do nothing but stare at the predators before me with wide eyes and a trembling jaw. The two skulls knelt down beside me, and, to my horror, one of them slid something from his belt. It was a wooden spoon, but the handle had been filed down to a deadly point. He waved it in front of my face. "'Gonna pay for that, new fish,' he said, his breathing still labored from where I'd landed on his chest. "'Gonna be the shortest stay in Furnace of all time.' Quick, said his friend, wiping the blood from his lip. Siren gonna go off any time. Lockdown. This creep doesn't deserve a quick death, the first skull hissed, raising his weapon above my stomach. Gonna bleed you. I closed my eyes and prayed that this wouldn't hurt too much. At that moment, I didn't even care about dying. I just didn't want to feel any pain. I tried to relax my muscles and picture myself somewhere else. On the beach with my family basking on that hot sand and cocoon by the sound and smell of the ocean. But the illusion was shattered by a roar. I thought at first that it was a skull screaming as he plunged the shank into my guts, but when my stomach remained intact, I opened my eyes to see a blurred shape flying past and my attacker reeling backward. The shape stopped and swiveled, bringing something hard down onto the head of the other skull. The tray made a satisfying crack as it hit, and behind it, I saw Z's face. I'm not doing this, he said as he kicked the kid beneath me in the ribs. The figure writhed and his arms loosened, letting me wiggle my way free. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. Past the roar of blood in my ears, I heard the sound of a siren and knew that lockdown was imminent. Run, Z shouted, throwing the tray to the floor with a crash and grabbing my sleeve. We careened across the trough room, leaping onto the tables to avoid the scattered benches and remains of lunch. I tried to remember what Donovan had said about lockdown, about how long the siren sounded before the cells were sealed. Was it a minute? Thirty seconds? We emerged into the yard to find it free of people but full of noise. From the hundreds of cells that lined the hall came shouts and cheers and whoops and whistles, all directed at us as we ran for the stairs. But we weren't going to make it. Halfway across the yard I heard the rattle of the cells shutting tight, followed by the hiss of pneumatics that signaled the vault door opening. I should never have stopped running, but I did. Fear and morbid curiosity forced me to halt, made me watch in horror as the massive portal swung open and the dogs bounded out. Hellhounds. Remember I told you I'd run from worse things in my life than the cops? 
Well, this was one of those occasions. They burst from the shadows like hounds from hell, sent by the devil to tear sinners to pieces and drag their screaming souls back to the underworld. The sheer where where they lost myself. The sheer power of their twisted bodies was betrayed by their lack of skin, their exposed muscles and tendons flexing and glistening in the unforgiving light of furnace as they came to a halt in the middle of the yard. Worst of all were their eyes, two emotionless silver pennies that shone from their wet faces, scanning the ground and eventually fixing on me. I stared back, lost in the twin moons of each creature. The glare and invisible fishing line that hooked itself into my eyes and stopped me from running. For a moment, nobody moved, but then one of the hounds raised its head and unleashed a howl, a sickening noise that sounded like the screams of a dying man. And they charged. Come on, I heard Z shout, grabbing my shoulder. I turned and bolted after him as he made for the nearest staircase, hearing the dogs scream again as they closed in for the kill. Hearing the noise in the surrounding cells reach a crescendo as the inmates settled in for the show. We scaled the steps three at a time, fear and adrenaline turning us into Olympic champions. I was shouting curse after curse, a torrent of swear words that I hoped would block the staircase behind me. It didn't work. By the time we had reached the top of the stairs, the dogs were advancing on the bottom. They had slowed their run to a leisurely prowl, knowing we had nowhere to go. The creatures seemed to relish the thought their massive jaws twisting into a grimace and dripping great gobs of saliva onto the steps. And they were right. There was nowhere to go. All the cells were locked tight. Next floor, hissed Z, and we started climbing again, my legs burning and my head spinning from the effort. We reached the second level and turned to see both dogs following us up the stairs, sparks flying from their feet every time their claws connected with the metal. Z bounded up one more flight of steps and started running along the platform, ignoring the whoops and hollers from the other side of the bars. Think, he screamed at me. Where are we going? Just head for the other stairwell, I replied, trying to make it sound like I had a plan. We bolted down the platform, the inmates inside watching, half in horror and half in fascination as the dogs followed us. One of the beasts was distracted by something inside a cell and threw itself at the bars, buckling them like they were made of plastic. My legs almost gave way there and then, as well as other parts of my body that I didn't really want to mention, but I managed to keep going. Halfway along the platform, the dogs got bored of prowling and broke into a trot, their huge feet making the platform shake in its casings every time they made contact, their eyes narrowing as they fixed on their prey. We reached the stairs and clambered up them, trying to look at where we were going and what was behind us at the same time. As long as we kept a stairwell in between us and the creatures, I felt okay. Talk about tempting fate. Tiring of the chase, the first dog hurled itself from the platform, leaping through the air above the courtyard and landing with a crash on the other side of the banister from me. Up close, its face was even more horrific. I could see past a set of stained and crooked teeth right down its red, raw red throat, a glistening abyss where I was about to meet my fate. Of all the ways I could have thought to die... This was the worst, chewed to pieces by a mutant dog. I staggered backward, tripping on a step and landing on my ass. The monster dug its claws into the metal and pulled itself over the stairwell, never taking its silver eyes off me. I could smell its fetid breath as it panted, the stench of death and decay that would accompany me to my end. It lowered itself ungracefully to the platform, making the whole thing tremble, and raised its head for the kill. I took one look at Z, frozen at the top of the stairs, then resigned myself to the inevitable, praying for the second time that day that my death wouldn't be too painful. But from the yard below came the sound of sobbing. The dog whipped its head around and stared through the metal railings, and I did the same. One of the skulls from the trough room, the one who had tried to kill me, was limping across the floor, begging at the top of his voice to be allowed back in his cell. The dog unleashed a deafening howl and leaped off the staircase. Despite being three floors up, it landed perfectly, speeding across the stone. I felt Z's hand on my shoulder and I had him help and let him help me to my feet. He started running up the stairs again, but I couldn't pull myself away from the events below. The second dog had also leaped from the platform and both were now closing in on their new victim. The skull was backing off, his face a mask of fear. He still held the sharpened wooden spoon in one hand, and he waved it in front of him. 
It looked like someone trying to stop a train with a toothpick. Come on, Alex, Z whispered. They're going to be back up here any minute. The dogs crouched down on their haunches, looking for a second as if they were about to curl up and go to sleep. But then they both sprang forward, jaws opened impossibly wide. The place where the skull had been standing was suddenly a blur of color, different shades of red battling it out with flashes of silver and shards of dirty white for supremacy in the sickening tableau. It was over in seconds. I didn't watch the dogs finish their meal. I just followed Z as he leaped up the stairs again. Beneath us, I heard a pair of blood-curdling howls gargled through wet throats. Then the sound of claws on metal as the dogs once again scaled the stairwell. What's the point? I hissed breathlessly as we reached the fourth level and kept on running. They're going to catch us. But Z didn't answer. I stopped for an instant to catch my breath and stole a glance through the stairs. One dog was below, bounding up the steps with frightening speed. The other was scaling the steps at the far end of the platforms. They were boxing us in. Fear lending us strength, we pushed ourselves up past the fifth level to the sixth, and were about to keep climbing when I saw a sight that I didn't quite believe. Midway down the row, my cell door was half open, wedged in place by a toilet seat of all things. Standing on the platform raving frantically at us was Donovan. I felt my entire body flood with relief and we both charged toward him, but before we made it past more than a couple of cells, the dog appeared at the far end and began hurtling our way. Z kept running, but I slammed to a halt and grabbed his sleeve. We'll never make it. That thing's going too fast, I said, pulling him back to the staircase we just left. We need to go up. Z started to argue, but I held up my hand. Trust me. We reached the staircase seconds before the first dog. It thrust its giant muzzle through the stairs from the platform below, twisting the metal and almost shearing off my foot. I leaped over it as it struggled to pull its wedged jaw free and looked back to see that the second dog was retreating to the far staircase. Leaping up the last couple of steps, we raced down the seventh level platform. A howl from behind us signaled that the creature was hot on our heels, and up ahead I saw the second dog emerge from the stairwell and crash down the walkway in our direction. In a matter of seconds, we were both going to be pedi pedigree dog food. What now? Z screamed. I stopped running and placed my hands on the railing that separated the platform from the yard seven floors below. The view made my stomach twist unpleasantly, and for a second, I didn't think I could do it. But the dogs were closing in, fast. We had no choice. I started clambering over the railing. G Z just stared at me. You can't be serious, he said. The dogs were ten steps away at most, bounding along the metal so fast it looked like they were flying. Z stopped arguing, swung a leg up, and threw his body over the railing so we were both standing on the other side, hovering about above the drop. It's only one floor, I said. Just drop and grab. I can't, he said. But he could. At that instant, the dog reached us. dogs reached us, launching themselves toward the railing in a frenzy of teeth and claws. I couldn't have held on to that bar even if I wanted to, my strength giving out milliseconds before the dog's jaws snapped shut to where my head had been. The second creature threw itself at Z, but he managed to let go. It soared over his head, snapping at us relentlessly as we all plummeted earthward. There was barely any time to react. The railing of the platform below shot toward me like a bullet. I reached out my hand and, more from blind luck than anything else, managed to grip the metal bar. It felt like my arm had been wrenched out of its socket, but I held on tight. Z had missed the bar, but had held on to the floor, his legs dangling helplessly above the void. The dog wasn't so lucky. Hitting the ground below with a dull thud, it whimpered as it struggled to its feet, the sound of broken bones grinding against one another setting my teeth on edge. It wouldn't be long before its friend worked out where we were, so I pulled myself over the banister and reached down for Z. Donovan appeared at my side, grabbing the boy's other hand, and together we pulled him to safely. safety. Quick, Donovan shouted, sprinting back down the platform to our cell. The door was still open, the automatic mechanism whining as it strained to slide shut. There was a howl behind us, and I snapped around to see the remaining dog charge along the platform. I could swear that its face was twisted into an expression of fury at what we had done to its brother. We jumped into the cell, Donovan coming in last and wrestling with the toilet seat. I helped him, gripping the stained metal and pulling with all my might. The dog was gaining. We were going to be trapped inside the cell with the creature at this rate. 
but when all seemed lost, the toilet seat popped free, sending Donovan and me flying backward into the, onto the bed. The cell door slid home, bolts securing it in place, and the dog crashed into the bars. They bent alarmingly, but they held. The creature thrashed against the metal for a few seconds before the siren cut through the prison again. It stood outside the cell, fixing us all with a silver glare like it was remembering our faces. Then it howled and fled back to the staircase. Whew. Okay, so we had a death. <laughs> so if I can get somebody to type in exclamation death, we are going to keep on going. I'm not ashamed to say that I spent the next few minutes crying my eyes out. Z did too. We sat huddled on the bottom bunk, sobbing helplessly, our exhausted bodies and fear-stricken minds unable to do anything else. As soon as the dogs had vanished back inside the vault door, the injured one barely able to drag itself over the threshold, Donovan started shouting at me, telling me how utterly stupid I had been to start a fight I couldn't win. But after a couple of insults, he stopped, staring at us both like we were a couple of upset toddlers, his expression half frustration and half pity. Eventually, he just shook his head and climbed onto his bunk. I wept solidly until I felt like I'd cried out my very soul, until it seemed as if there was nothing left inside of me. Then, I lay back on the bed, staring into space and trying to forget that I even existed. I don't know whether it was minutes or hours later that I finally remembered my manners. Thanks, I breathed, little more than a whisper. Thanks for saving our lives. The bed creaked as Donovan shifted his weight above me, and I heard a grunt that might have been an acknowledgement. It was a gentle cough from my side, and I turned to see Z looking at me expectantly. Oh, hey, Spartan. <laughs> How are you doing? Get comfy. I'm actually getting ready to... Um, I might go ahead and do one more chapter here in just a moment, but this is definitely not a comfy book, even though it's pretty good. Um... But we're going to be raiding here in just a little bit. I might go ahead and do one more chapter after this. I'm just in pain. <laughs> I did something stupid. Anyways. Oh yeah, thanks to you too, I said, recalling the events in the trough room. Events that seemed like they belonged in another lifetime. You saved my ass, -y. You owe me one, big time, was his reply. But his mouth was bent up in what I thought was probably a smile. Big time. At least we made it, I said. We survived. I was surprised to hear Donovan laughing, a chuckle that was entirely devoid of humor. Yeah, you made it, yeah, but for how long, he asked. Those dogs don't forget a face, especially when you leave one of them with broken legs. And as for the skulls, he didn't need to finish. I knew that as soon as I got out of my cell, they would be coming after me. I mean, we'd just gotten one of their number killed. I was truly skull fodder now. Part of me started wishing that the dogs had eaten all the gang members from the canteen, but the thought made me feel sick. Do you see it now? Donovan continued. This place isn't a joke. It's not some film or book or computer game where you get infinite lives. You foul up out there, then you die. It's as simple as that. And you two fouled up today. Big time. He echoed Z's accent. Big time. What happened to the other skulls? I asked, trying to change the subject. The ones from the trough room. Hold up someplace, probably trembling in their little bandanas. Guards will flush them out in a minute. What about us? Will we get punished? asked Z. I suddenly pictured what Donovan had said about solitary confinement. Tried not to think about going mad in a lightless pit at the bottom of the world. Maybe, maybe not, he replied. You never know what's going to happen in this place. Could end up in the hole. Could just be left alone. Could be taken tonight. All a mystery till it happens. The siren pierced my skull as once again the vault door opened. This time, two black suits strode out, armed with shotguns, and made their way toward the canteen. They passed the pool of dark liquid that was all that remained of the skull and vanished through the wall. Less than a minute later, the three remaining skulls emerged from the trough room, hands clasped above their heads, one of the shotguns pointed at their backs as they marched toward the stairs. They disappeared from view, but I heard one of the black suits shout out a cell number, followed by the muffling sound of a door opening. It happened twice more. Then the thunderous sound of the black suit's boots began to get louder as they made their way along our platform. 
I pressed myself back against the far wall, but there was nowhere to go, and I was helpless as the two grinning faces appeared at the bars. Always the fresh meat, said one. New kids think they can cause trouble. I tried to apologize, but my mouth was so dry I couldn't make my tongue work. One of the black suits ran his hands along the bar, curved inward from the weight of the dog. Open F-11, he boomed. The cell door moved a few centimeters before the buckled bars jammed against their casings. The man grabbed hold of the door and pulled, the muscles beneath his suit straining so hard that I thought the fabric would rip. With the sound of screeching metal, the solid bars relented, snapping back into place and allowing the door to slide open. The men didn't enter. They just pointed at Z. You, come with us. Me, he asked, his voice barely audible. Z looked at me as if I could help. I swallowed hard, then stood up, hands held out in submission. It's me you want, I said slowly. I started it. Well, look at Mr. Noble, said the black suit who had bent the door. Don't kiss ass, kid. You're in the right cell. He's not. It's a breach of lockdown rules. Now get over here, Hatcher. Z reluctantly stood and walked toward the cell door. The men raised their evil-looking weapons and ushered him outside. I'm so sorry, Z, I said, but he was already walking off. I had a sudden flashback to Toby, lying dead on the floor of a stranger's house, his life taken because of my stupidity, my greed. I couldn't believe it was happening again. Close F-11. The cell door rumbled shut and I gripped the bars, trying to see what was happening. Z was marched to the stairs, vanishing as he was led down to his fate. Where are they taking him? I asked Donovan. What are they going to do to him? It's my fault all this happened, not his. The answer came a second later when I heard a shot sound out across the prison, echoing off the stone walls and piercing my heart. I sank down to my knees, trying to force time to reverse, trying to undo what I'd made happen. But then the noise came again, not a shot, but the crack of metal on metal. Open D-24, came a voice, and the sound continued. The noise of a cell door opening. I rested my forehead against the cold bars, offering a prayer of thanks to anything that was listening. I heard the door close, followed a short while later by the siren as the men in black retreated. He's okay, I muttered. We're okay. But Donovan simply laughed that chilling laugh. No, Alex, you're dead. You just don't know it yet. Thanks for listening. If you're new to my channel, my name is Jubilee. I'm a reading streamer over at Twitch. If you've enjoyed this reading, please follow me there to get a notification of when I'm going live. You'll find all of my links to my socials in the description box below. My normal streams are on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights starting at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. And if there are any other dates or times announced, they are going to be in my Discord. Thank you again for listening and be blessed.